We're going to be in Mark, whoops, sorry. We're going to be in Mark chapter 4 this morning, and it is the parable of the sower. You know, when I was growing up, we had two gardens. One garden was 60 by 40, and another garden was 80 by 30. And we'd till that garden, but the one garden in particular, we, we took dirt from the field that we had, and we screened the dirt. And I don't know if this might be really old for some of you, but we had chicken wire doubled up on, on a slant like this on a, on a frame. And we'd throw the dirt up that chicken wire and it would go through there and the rocks would fall out. And so we didn't have any rocks in our, our garden. We had 18 inches thick soil that was all that screened dirt. And Dad was very picky about this. And it was a great garden. Every year, I mean, we were in there probably three days a week, picking all the little weeds before they got to be big weeds. And, and that garden was like perfect and it produced. It was great soil. I remember when, when we would go traveling in British Columbia that Armstrong, BC, which is just a little town just north of Vernon, BC, the soil there is unbelievably rich. It is just dark. When you look from the highway, you look down, it looked black. It was so rich. And the crops, I remember the crops on there, looking at the crops that came up in that land going, wow. I mean, they were so thick. And there was so much. And, and you know, we can do that. We, we look at fields, at farmers' fields, and we look at the crops, and we say, well, that must be good soil there. Or that isn't such good soil when they're just kind of sparse sticking up. And we make that judgment. Well, Jesus, he's by the sea here in Matthew chapter 4. says, And he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them. So he's teaching them in parables. And, and what he would do, these parables consisted of these kinds of stories that he got from everyday life around him. He would pick something up that they were doing, like when they were walking through the grain field. He said, let me tell you about, and he told them a parable, and they had to deal with that. So Jesus says, I want to teach you a parable here. He says, a sower went out, to, a farmer went out to sow. And, and so a parable, Jesus takes a story, a physical story that everybody could relate to, and he teaches them a spiritual truth. And he says, the farmer went out to sow. And when they sowed, it wasn't these big machines where you see them out in the field today with the cedars behind them and air cedars and planting and everything. They would go out and they would sow like this. They would be casting the seed. They'd have their bag or their bucket of seed and, and they'd be out there and they'd be going like this and they'd be casting the seed. And they'd take a step and that was their measurement. And the next step and that was their measurement. And they got amazing, it was amazingly sowed evenly. But that's what they did. And so he says he cast his seed and some landed on the path. Well, they had paths through their fields. If you lived in Judea and you were traveling from your house to a friend's house that was three miles away, you didn't go down 48th Avenue a mile and then down 52nd Street a mile and then turn left and go down another street or avenue. There were paths through the fields. And you would take these paths and you'd walk right beside the grain that was growing in these fields. And he said when the farmer went out to sow, he'd be casting it and some would land on this path. And before it gets a chance, now if you understand, if you've ever tried to sow a lawn in packed dirt, good luck. The birds get the seed, the seed gets trampled, whatever happens. But he says here, it doesn't get time to root. I mean, as soon as that seed's thrown out, the birds are there and they're picking up that seed and they're eating that seed. He said, but some of the seed that he was casting also landed on the rocky soil or the rocky ground. And growing up in BC, I had the privilege of understanding this quite clearly. When you in the mountains, a lot of times your base was rock. And you'd find a rock with about 
three quarters of an inch of soil on it. And it'd be standing up there all alone and there'd be something growing in that soil. And you'd say, wow, that's amazing. All of this rock, there's that little bit of dirt and this thing's growing in there. But it didn't last long. In the heat of the summer sun, it was in no time that plant wilted and was gone. Because it didn't get any root. It didn't have any depth to its root. And so he says some of the seed fell on that kind of ground. And then he says some fell among the thorns. Now I don't know about you, but I grew up where I grew up. There were thistles everywhere. I mean, and thistles dominate. If you don't get rid of thistles, you aren't going to see your grain. All you'll see is thistles. They just take over everything. They choke out the grain. They choke out the vegetables. They choke out everything. And they just take over. They grow, I think, ten times as fast as any vegetable or wheat or, or anything else. They just choke everything out. And he says, so some fell in amongst the thorns as well. And then some fell on the good soil. And you know, what do you think the farmer was trying to do? He's trying to get that seed in the good soil, right? He wanted, he wanted to get some crop. He wanted his crop to come. He wanted to have some food to eat, maybe make a little money selling some of that stuff. And so he's, he's looking for the good soil. But in the process of, of sowing the seed, some fell on all these different types of soil. But the good soil, I mean, that stuff started producing. It produced 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. And I remember Dad emphasizing this with the garden. He said, the amount of time you put into putting manure on there and cultivating it in and, and, and working that soil so that the roots had lots of freedom to just go where they wanted to go and grow and, and produce. He said, the more you, you work on that good soil, the better it's going to be. And he was right. I mean, our gardens were the envy of the town that we lived in. Our gardens produced, if you can imagine those two gardens we had, produced enough beans and cucumbers and peas and tomatoes and, and, and all the vegetables that you can think of, carrots and everything and lettuce and onions, that we canned for a family with nine kids and it lasted us the whole winter till the next garden grew. So they produced crop. So Jesus gives him this parable. And then, he, and then when he's alone in verse 10, they come to him, some of them along with the twelve, and they ask him about parables. Why are you teaching in parables? And he says, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables. Now I want you to understand something. He's not talking about a secret. Jesus is in no way trying to keep a religious secret here. But that's kind of the way it reads. But what he's really talking about and how that word should be defined is a mystery. You've been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. See, in, in 1 Corinthians... And in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse starting in verse 6, he says, Yet among the mature we do not impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret or a mystery and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches things, even the depths of God. And so Paul says, I have a mystery here, the mystery of the kingdom, and it's not to keep it secret, but it is to reveal it. My purpose is to reveal that mystery. And so over in Ephesians chapter 3, he's writing to the church at Ephesus there, 
And he says in Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 3, he says, How the mystery was made known to me by revelation, and as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. When Jesus says the secret has been made known to you, he's saying the mystery has been revealed to you or is being revealed to you. But then he says, but those outside, to them everything is parables. And what he's really saying, I believe, is that everything are stories. Maybe stories for their amusement, maybe stories for their imagination, but, but no truth in it. And what he's talking about really here is the idea of concealing and revealing. Jesus was revealing the mystery, but there was a concealing also going on. But the concealing had to do with the hearer concealing and not Jesus concealing. And we have to keep that perspective right. Because Jesus was revealing it. Even though he was speaking in parables, he said those who are focused on Christ, who are focused on the kingdom of God, who are focused spiritually, they will understand these parables. It's not that they're incomprehensible. It's not that they can't be understood. They're not that difficult. He's saying they are shutting their ears. They are not spiritually in tune with God. They think they have it all figured out. And so they are blinded and they don't get it. They just see it as a story. But he said those that are focused in on God are seeing it for what it really is. And so then he quotes the prophet. And he says, So that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he's not saying they can't be forgiven. He's not saying he doesn't want them to be forgiven. He's saying they are so blinded by their heart and their mindset that they cannot perceive, they can't see it. Even though they have eyes, they're not seeing it. Even though they have ears, they're not hearing it. They're not seeing it spiritually and they're not hearing the spiritual truth. And that's why I speak in parables. Because I want the ones that are tuned in to get it and the ones that just want to make a mess of this thing anyways, they're not going to get it. And so I'm teaching in parables so that you can, they can understand the ones that want to see it. And, and, the, and then he says, and you don't get this parable? <laughs> well, he says, let me explain the parable to you. He said, the seed, that's the word of God. The seed is the word of God being cast out to people. The soils, that's the hearts of men. So he says, Understand this. It is about putting the word out there and it is about the hearts of men hearing it and either receiving it or rejecting it. That's what it's all about. He said, you know the ones on the path? Let me explain the path to you. He said, we put the word of God out there and he says, Satan is right there. I mean, he's right on top of that Johnny on the spot. And he says, I want that. And he takes it away from them. And they don't, it never gets time to settle into their heart and to take root. And I'm sure you've all shared the gospel with somebody like that. I mean, I remember sharing the gospel with one fella. And man, it had, the words hadn't even gotten out of my mouth. And he was threatening me. He wanted to take me out. I tell you what, Satan was really close there. Taking that word away before it ever got to his heart. Because Satan wasn't about to allow that to happen. And that's what he's saying. There are some hearts that are so hard against God that that seed will just bounce right off of there and go somewhere else. Satan will take it away. They don't, I mean, it'll never reach that heart. It's just too hard. And then he said there's those on the rocky ground. And he said, um, 
And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. They have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Have you had that experience? I mean, you share with somebody, and man, they come off of their chair, they're so excited. And they want to be baptized and they jump into that thing. You're saying, just a minute, we'll, we'll count the cost. You know, you need to understand the commitment you're making. Oh, I want to do this. I want Jesus to be my Lord. And they get all excited. And a week later, you're looking around and they're nowhere to be found. And you phone them up and they said, oh, well, mama said, son, what did you do that for? And I couldn't disappoint my mama. And, and papa said, there is no God, what are you thinking? And, and so I got all this persecution going on on me now. I don't like it. And so they're being persecuted because of the word of God. And they turn. They don't have any root. They don't have any staying power. They're not really convicted down into the depths of the heart. It just hit kind of the top of the heart and got a little bit of root in the very top of the heart. And phew, it's taken away by the persecutions of this world. And then he said, let me tell you about the heart that's a thorny ground. There's others that are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter, into the, enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. I mean, these people receive the word and it starts to grow in their heart and they're very excited about it and they seem to be very authentic about it and they're going along and then reality hits oh I have to make this payment and I have to get this and I want to do that and and I got to keep up with my neighbor and 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 they start thinking about the riches of this world and they start thinking about the things they need or they want and more they want than they need. And, and all of those cares and those concerns overpower the Word of God in their heart. And they succumb to that pressure and it pushes the Word of God out of their hearts. Know anybody like that? For sure. Paul had all kinds of experiences like that. He had people that said they were devoted to him and then when the road got rough, they were gone. And that's why he didn't want to take Mark on his second missionary journey with them because he said he quit on the first one as soon as the pressure hit. And I don't want that to happen a second time. Now Mark proved himself to be better than that. He was young and he was new in the faith and it took him a little while. And we got to be understanding about people taking time and having to work through these struggles. But Jesus said, that's the thorny ground. And then he said, but there's the heart. There's that one heart or there's those hearts that they are just so fertile. They are so rich and ready for the word of God. And fortunately, I've experienced a few hearts like that as well. And they are just so open to the word of God and they take that word of God in and it's planted in their heart and they begin almost immediately to produce fruit. I mean, yes, being a Christian, it takes time and it's growth and it's growth all the time. But that heart is just taking that word in and it's taking root and it's growing and it's maturing and it's producing fruit and it's producing fruit according to the gifts that God's given that person, whether it be 30 fold or 60 fold or 100 fold. It doesn't matter. It's producing fruit. It is a heart that wants the Word of God in it and is allowing that Word to take root. And that Word then is showing in the way they live their lives. And he said, that's the good soil. But he said, the farmer went out to sow. And you need to understand this. How does that apply to you and to me today? How do we take this parable and apply it to our lives. Well, being on this side of the fence, being with Christ, we are the farmers. We are the ones that go out and cast 
the seed. We sow. And we sow it everywhere. He says, you just go out and it's going to fall on the path. It's going to fall on, on the, the, in the thorny ground and the rocky ground. And it's going to fall on good soil. He said, but your job is to go out and to spread the seed, to spread the word of God. Just cast it up. Don't worry of what kind of heart it's going to fall on. You don't determine whether it's a good heart or a thorny heart or a rocky heart or a heart that's like the path that's so hard that nothing gets in. That is not your problem. That is not for you to decide. What I want you to do is be that farmer and I want you to go out and I want you to cast the seed. That's all you need to do. And where it starts to grow and where it starts to flourish, you water and you continue to nurture. The ones that the bird picks up, you're not going to do anything about. The one that Satan takes it away from, you can't help that person. The one that is determined to let the material things of this world rule their heart over the word of God. You can't worry about it. You can't make them do it differently. It's their choice. So all you want to do is go out and cast a seed. You want to spread the word of God to all the hearts. Every type. And then you trust in God. And you let God. You see, we have a little problem with that. We don't always like to let God. We think, no, no, no. If I could just do this, that person will get it. If I could just do that, that heart would change. I got to tell you, I've been through that for 17 years now, and some of them just don't change. And, and you could take a sledgehammer and beat that hard and it won't change. You can't do it. The Word has to do it. And if the heart isn't the right soil, it's not going to happen. And that's what God says. But I want you to see this. You need to trust in God. Because in Isaiah... And I love Isaiah. Isaiah is a very, he was a great prophet. But in Isaiah 55 and verse 11, he kind of struggled sometimes with spreading the word of God himself, and so did Jeremiah. But he says in verse 11, well, I'm going to read verse 10 too, because it gives us a setting, the same setting as the sowing and reaping here. It says, for, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Do we understand that? God says, you sow the word and the word's going to do its work. It's going to accomplish the task that I've given it to accomplish. And he says, so, whether it convicts a soul and brings a soul to the kingdom, that's wonderful. And, that's, and we, we rejoice over that. And the angels rejoice over that. But he said, it also will condemn the soul that rejects it. So the word never comes back empty. It always gets the job done. It, it, it shows the condition of the heart of that person. So whether it's one or many. John 12 and verse 48, Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save the world. But the one who rejects me, and Jesus is the word, remember that. The one that rejects me, he already has that which judges him judges him. The very word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. God's word, brothers and sisters, we need to throw out that we need to cast it on whatever soil. And most of all, we need to make sure that our heart is the good soil. And then we need to cast it out there. And where it lands, it lands. And if it grows, wonderful. If it doesn't, it's still done its job. If you're here this morning, and you haven't responded to the call of Christ to become a child of His, that word is sown on your heart. You determine what kind of soil, soil your heart is. Will that word produce fruit? 
or will it be rejected or smothered out by the cares of the world? That's your choice. But we invite you to come and, and, and be, be put into Christ, be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and to walk with him anew in life while we stand and sing. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let his praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing on the promises of God.